So thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about uh, our partnership with Tremco um, uh, and the Tremco Sustainable Practices uh, series that we have. Steve Hughes is here from, from Tremco. And over the past three years, uh, they've invested in us all. And we've invested in them a little bit um, to support uh, lectures related to sustainability and other activities related to sustainable practices in general. Uh, and that includes us uh, providing opportunities for students, or them providing opportunities, but us providing a little bit of the support for students to take up in internship uh, trainings at Tremco's uh, locations, either in, in uh, Toronto or Cleveland, or, or kind of both, uh, which are their North American um, headquarters. And uh, Tremco is part of a, a kind of global company sort of headquartered, I think, in Germany called RPM. Uh, there's a host of uh, very interesting companies, if you want to look that up sometime. And what's been great, again, there's always been, uh, in this three-year time, uh, terrific support from Tremco, and some very interesting things that have come up. Uh, Tremco started uh, playing with architecture schools at the University of Toronto and established a thing called the BEST series. And uh, Christoph Reinhardt, who's our lecturer here, uh, has actually given a lecture in that series at Toronto. We were just talking about that. And uh, one of the things that's been evolving a little, a little further, that's something hopefully to look forward to here, is we've been reaching out a little bit to set up a bit of a network around the U.S. and, and Canada, starting with, with uh, University of Toronto as, our, as a bit of our home base, and maybe us as a bit of an, Amer uh, an American rather than North American home base, uh, including schools like Clemson and the University of Washington and Florida International. And I'm sure I'm forgetting some other ones, but there's about six or six or so of us, University of Maryland, that met to try to see whether spreading some uh, related sustainability education might set up a network of opportunity for you guys as students and for faculty members to share ideas. And we'll keep cooking that along, and, and maybe we can get Christoph to play in that and MIT and, and other schools coming forward. Uh, so I just wanted to start out by thanking Tremco for that and giving you a little bit of that background. And, and now I'll have Nate Fash come up and introduce tonight's lecture. Thank Thanks very much. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everybody, for coming out um, tonight. Let the record show that despite the power outage a couple of weeks ago, we persevered. Yeah. And um, we're really grateful to Christoph for being accommodating and uh, rescheduling on short notice. Um, so let me say a few things about our guest tonight. Christoph Reinhardt is a building scientist and an architectural educator working in the field of sustainable building design and environmental modeling. At MIT, he leads the Sustainable Design Lab which is an interdisciplinary group with a grounding in architecture that develops design workflows, planning tools, and metrics to help evaluate the environmental performance of buildings and neighborhoods with respect to operational embodied energy use, walkability, daylighting potential, um, some really interesting stuff. Products originating from the group, um, such as Diva, Mapdwell, Daysim and UMI are used in practice and education in over 90 countries, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about them tonight. Um, before joining MIT in 2012, Christoph led the sustainable, sustainable Design concentration at Harvard's Graduate School of Design, where the student forum voted him the 2009 Teacher of the Year uh, out of 77 instructors in the department. And having been a student of his during that period, I can tell you that was entirely well deserved. <laughs> Prior to joining the faculty at Harvard, Christoph had worked as a staff scientist at the National Research Council of Canada and the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems in Germany. Uh, he currently serves on the editorial board of several journals and has authored over 100 peer-reviewed scientific articles, uh, including a textbook on daylighting and four book chapters. He, uh, his work has been supported by a variety of organizations, including the National Science Foundation, Autodesk, United Technology Corporation, Sage Electrochromics, Transsolar Climate Engineering, and the governments of Canada, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. Christoph's work has been recognized with various awards, among them the Arab Best Paper Prize at the Building Simulation uh, at Building Simulation 
2009 and the 2010 Leon Gaster Prize from the Society of Light and Lighting. In 2013, Buildings for Change magazine voted him one of its inaugural stars of building and science. Uh, and the Sustainable Design Lab spin-off Mapdwell has been recognized with Fast, Company De Fast Company's Design by Innovation 2015 Award for Data Visualization, as well as the Sustainia 100 Award. So with that, please join me in welcoming Christoph Reinhardt. Thanks, Nate. Good evening. Thanks, Nate. That uh, was very nice. I think I have to update the website and see what the things that we have on here. Uh, thank you all for coming and joining uh, us tonight for this lecture series. I think it's fantastic when schools of architecture engage always and have dedicated series uh, related to sustainability as well. And um, hopefully you'll learn something new here. Since uh, this is a school of architecture, even though the title speaks of sustainable urban ar um, architecture, Architecture. I effectively um, uh, I broke the talk into two components. In the first component, I mostly speak about our work related to the individual building level, and then we are spanning out and also including work at the neighborhood and whole city level in terms of an analysis. And as always, the um, research that I'm showing has been the work of many people, a lot of them uh, listed at uh, the bottom, that worked with us in the Sustainable Design Lab or at uh, the various companies that we spun out. Uh, here you see our uh, last year on our annual lab hike. Um, to give you a sense of the profile of the individuals working on here, they are all architects by training, but also have degrees in computer science and building science. So I try to work with people that have all three uh, fields in one so that we can basically design the type of tools uh, that we do design. And our common interest is that we want to change um, current practice, come, whether it comes to architecture or urban planning. And what we mean by that, we're trying to observe, being in a school of architecture and urban planning, how currently the profession is working. And then we are trying to uh, introduce new workflows that are cognizant of current practice so that they easily can be implemented and then hopefully lead to better informed decision during building design. <laughs> Uh, so who's Brett, uh, E to Song I Sing? Usually we uh, provide some uh, background of the various companies that have uh, supported us over the years. Uh, I guess there's a, uh, there's a space for Tremco here. Yeah. Uh, just, <laughs> uh, no. so, uh, so typically the way we are um, operating, we've done a lot of work for uh, basic uh, organizations such as National Science Foundation, but we find our work increasingly being uh, working with energy companies such as Exelon. And that is really a phenomenon, not just uh, in our world, but in general, that uh, you can still design individual buildings, but as buildings become larger and uh, we are nearing a low carbon economy, the relationship between the individual building and the surrounding grid becomes more and more integrated. And that's just a reflection uh, of us trying to uh, basically understand this integration better and help designers to uh, move productively forward there. So the background of what we are doing is uh, a field called building performance simulation. That's really the bread and butter. So it's the computer-based attempt to model the various heat and mass flows around buildings. So what does this mean? It basically means that we want to use this awesome tool to predict our everyday experience, every, uh, everything about us. So the, the heat going into and out of the buildings, uh, the air, the sunlight that shines onto you. And once we are able to basically mimic in a computer our everyday life experience, then we can not only predict energy use in buildings, but we can also derive new types of metrics, such as the return on investment of a building or the comfort conditions in the building, even walkability. And uh, that's the goal behind our work. So why do you want to do that, live in the virtual world in SimCity? Well, uh, effectively, there are two approaches for that. One is uh, when you design a more complicated building that before the building's being built, you want to test whether it's actually working and it's code compliant. You may think of green building rating systems such as LEED. Uh, from our end, that's actually the really boring part that's just basically ticking off boxes. So we really want to use it in situ, in situ during design. And whether it's a neighborhood or just a facility, Sad. In all cases, the idea is really the same, right? That you come up uh, with a concept, with a design, and then you analyze it with one way or another. May Is it comfortable? Is there light? 
Is it energy efficient? And then, and that's the hard part, you have to adapt your design. If you love it, how it looks or not, right? Or if you do so, then at least it, uh, these uh, type of analysis uh, has been productive. And then you go around in circles. So how often does this actually happen? This is some work from us a couple of years ago where we asked a couple of larger architecture firms that have in-house consultants and that do a lot of sustainable design work. So how often do simulation actually change your building, change your design? And you see two uh, bars here um, on the right-hand side. This is the firms that um, outsource uh, the consulting and basically have uh, firms that they pay for that at the end of the design process uh, check off the boxes. Not surprising there in many cases the simulations don't change to the design, which is just a built-in um, uh, in the relationship between the uh, simulationist and the design firm that makes a lot of sense. But even the uh, you know leading firms that have in-house consultants, even there you have pretty high levels of times when somebody does an analysis and it doesn't do anything to the design. And that's uh, really the number that we want to change. And the reason for this is it's not very easy to do this. Even if you do an analysis of a building very often, the designer might not understand what it means, doesn't know how to react to that and this productive discussion making it better is really what we try to do within our lab. So within today's presentation, I have really three components. The first one is relatively short. It's just to review and to convince you that the tools that we are talking about here actually work. So then the second part is uh, about uh, using and applying these tools at the individual building level for daylighting and for um, uh, sustainable facade design. Sorry here, I have something popping up on my screen. And then finally, uh, we're spreading out to our work on urban modeling itself. So the question first is, do today's simulation performance simulation programs actually work? And a lot of this work has been done during the 90s already. Here you see this really, nowadays we would find them cheesy boxes that people put in out and measure temperature and put in thermal slabs. This is the Hades of the solar architecture movement from the 70s and onwards. And there we developed effectively, well, not we, those people before us develop the tools and methods that really allow us to very reliably predict if we understand everything about a building, how the temperature in the buildings, for example, going to change. And nowadays, this is, has become pretty much an accepted industry. If you think of ASHRAE, ASHRAE has basically standards for both the simulation tools that you can use, and you can even become a certified energy modeler. And uh, that is nice, but what is really nice is that the IRS also supports this. So when you have um, um, a building and you want to implement certain energy efficiency measures, then obviously you're not going to uh, build this building twice, once with, once without the measure to show how much savings you have. So somehow for your building you have to make these predictions. And the IRS accepts the use of these programs effectively when you say this is building is going to save 20% of its energy use, then you can write this difference of your taxes, the energy savings. And this is ultimately the financial engine that drives a lot of this um, this industry. So this is all nice. Now, if we look at the moment of truth and we look at the first generation of LEED certified buildings, then what you see here is a plot that compares the simulated energy use and the measured energy use during design and first year operation. And if these tools were all nice and perfect, then you wouldn't see any dots because everything would lie on the identity line, which is obviously not the case. In fact, the lab buildings are the ones, the la you can basically keep it as a rule of thumb. The larger and more complex the building is, the more energy it uses compared to what the prediction was. And that's not really surprising. If you think about it in the computer, the world is perfect. Uh, every window is clean. Every, um, every thermostat gets set the way we wish and reality is not as clean. So uh, there's some kind of discrepancy there, which is why uh, commissioning a building is very, very important. Well, you could of course also say, well, maybe the tools don't work. So in order just to address that, we worked with a company called Anna Model in Canada, which has um, been the lead consultant for 30% of, I think, all lead certified buildings in Canada. And here you see effectively during the design process, the predictions of the simulation model and the during a commissioning process. So you see that this is slightly moving over towards the identity line. 
And that means on the one hand side that these tools work. It's also a new evolving industry or activity that when you have a complex building, you actually have your building facilities manager run these simulations to see if your building actually does what it should be doing or not. So this is the energy car part. Uh, when it comes to lighting, uh, that's of course something that's very dear to the heart of many designers. So when we talk about a lighting simulation, then there can be a lot of confusion because in a way, uh, modes of simulating light, there are many of them. So here you see a little study, for example, that's the top floor of Renzo Piano's Harvard Museum's uh, extension in Cambridge. So this is the space that's being built. This is actually a sketch from the design team very early on. In the process and there they already try to capture something of how the space is going to feel. Then on the top right you see a typical architectural rendering of how the architects would communicate to the client how the space is going to look. And now the physically based simulation looks similar but only here you can say every uh, every pixel in the image is a lighting uh, measurement. So this is really the only one of the four that, that tries to communicate how bright in absolute terms is it actually going to be, whereas the other ones are equally important, right? Obvious, very often these lighting simulations are not very successful in communicating uh, the mood of the space, for example. But when it comes to us trying to predict really how bright is it going to be, this is what we're focusing on. And how good are we at doing so? There have been a whole series of studies over the, uh, over the years, over the decades, and you can remember that these tools, when you use them right, can effectively model reality with a very high degree of accuracy. You have an error of only 20%. So if you take a light meter in a building and I model it right and I measure it, then you're within 20% uh, discrepancy, which is really excellent because our eye acts as a logarithmic sensor, so you couldn't say the difference within your eye as well. So uh, we could say we can model reality if we do everything right good enough. And now we are moving towards not just modeling in luminances, but modeling the whole luminance distribution in the field of view. And um, one of the recent efforts from our group is to make these tools faster. So those of you that are doing lighting, architectural rendering probably know that these tools take forever and they are really far away from being real time. We uh, developed for Radiance a new version which is graphics card based and uh, that's about a hundred times faster uh, than Radiance itself. But where we really want to be is real time renderings because there's something interesting happening. Either you you design with a building, you do a lighting analysis, and then you wait 10 minutes or an hour. That interrupts your flow. If you really want to be in the building and understand how the building works, you want your results back in half a second. So this is our current prototype. This is from Nathaniel Jones from our lab, who just graduated. He works now at Arup. This is a real-time glare rendering of, uh, of the gun tall at GSD. So effectively, you can walk through that space. And whenever your meter here says it's too bright or not too bright, then um, you get real-time feedback as you design. And obviously, we have to make everything now virtual reality. So with this, you can actually put on your glasses and walk through the building and see right away where the glare source is within the building. And then in real time, you can change and see what's happening next. So the tools are available, and they're becoming uh, reaching a point where you can just use them while you're having your Rhino or other CAT environment open, basically see how the actual building is going to behave as well. What's coming next? Uh, this is something that we've spent the last uh, year or so working on. Uh, this is spectral rendering. So you might have heard about the ongoing uh, life and uh, health debate. Uh, actually, thinking about the Nobel Prize in medicine was just given out to uh, the three uh, researchers that found out the effects of light on our circadian rhythm in fruit flies. Well, we are not fruit flies, but we also have uh, a, a clock in our brain. And there's a lot of interesting work going that basically when we trigger blue lights, we can uh, advance or delay our circadian clock. And so to be able to measure and predict this in buildings, we've been working with Harvard Medical School on this method that allows us to model the interior of a building everywhere in the world, any direction you look uh, spectrally. So then we can overlay different action spectrum on top of that and see how alert is this place going to be for you. So if you wait a couple of years we'll be able to effectively model for a whole year in a space tell you how awake you will be right now in this building. 
guilty, especially if we know how much you slept last night and so forth. So um, this kind of concludes part one. This was really just more of an overview and uh, assure you that the tools that are going to use in the following actually can mimic reality. So now when you have this awesome ability to model everything anywhere where you want to, what can you actually do with that? And when it comes to lighting and daylighting, we're using this... Um, this schema here. So when we want to evaluate a space and say, well, is this a well daylit comfortable space? Then we think of these three different concerns. So uh, to call it daylight, obviously there has to be daylight in the space. So the daylight availability is key. Then depending on the lighting condition you encounter in a space, there is we are doing this for the occupants. So we want to understand visual comfort conditions within the space, how people are going to react to that. And then there is uh, another reaction going back, right, because if the occupants don't like it, they might leave or uh, they might close the blinds, turn on the lights. So you have this interesting relationship here going on between the buildings that you design and the people in the buildings. And then all of this uh, falls into a new energy use. And this is a very interesting uh, uh, topic to understand. So the worst case you can encounter is this. Oh, this is really dark here. So this is a typical European building, right? The occupants, God beware, can do everything. They can open the window, they can close the blinds, and they can turn on the lighting. And so we somehow have to predict, and that's a messy business, what people are going to do in buildings. Uh, and then, or you pick the other extreme. This is the Rolex Center uh, by Sana in Switzerland, where the occupants can't do anything effectively. Uh, the clockwork is basically setting the blinds at every moment in time to create adequate lighting conditions. Or, uh, if that's too complicated, you can just think of a more architectural control. You find that in a lot of libraries where there are no moving parts here in New York City Public Library. The form and the shape of the building just, you have to get it right so that by itself it can accommodate all the light day lighting conditions over the year and not create any glare within the building. And maybe as a third alternative, third alternative, if you go back to the Sana building, that's actually a building without any real furniture. If you've been there, it's a really great building. Uh, it's a university workspace <laughs> of sorts. Uh, but every, there are only beanbags in the space. So if you feel glare anywhere, pick up your beanbag and leave, right? So, I mean, this is basically you're flipping it around rather than having very constrained conditions where everybody sits at their workspace and we have to control lighting there. We can also just open it up and leave it up to the users to do whatever they want, right? So um, now quickly, how do you actually evaluate uh, the daylight availability part? So we have models for uh, for this. Obviously, we can model, we can model controls, and we have even some models that predict how people interact with the space. So how do I mimic daylighting? And this is some uh, work that has been done by now eight, nine, ten years ago. It's now in LEED and uh, um, in the LEED Green Building Rating System. It's our effort to say, when I look at a building, where is it daylit and where is it not uh, daylit? That's, of course, not really a binary thing, because when you go in a lit space, it's not that anywhere within your building the lighting completely disappears. But you can say at one point it's just not as useful anymore. So we're going to say, well, this is where really the daylit area ends. And what has been done a couple of years ago is basically that we've uh, developed computer methods that allow us to model for the whole year, for every hour in the year, how much lighting levels there are. And then if we say we need 300 lux, we want to know how often we reach that level. And that's called daylight autonomy. So for example here, so you see for a south-facing space, or oh, I think I have to stay here, uh, the daylight uh, autonomy um, levels away from the window. So easy to remember, when you're right sitting near a window, then the designer cannot mess it up. You basically over 95% of the time will get lighting levels. It becomes more interesting if you move further and further away. And at the 50% mark, this effectively means half of the time when people are in the building, there's plenty of light. And that we consider a daylight space. Well, the question then, of course, is just because we say this is so, how do people in buildings perceive this? Um, in order to understand that, we first did a study uh, with architecture students uh, at uh, the Carpenter Center uh, at Harvard uh, by Le Corbusier. So here, this is the second floor studio space. Um, 
it's actually more daylight when, than the image suggests. And we gave everybody a floor plan. Here's the window, here's the floor plan. Just said, draw the line where you think the lighting ends. And that we've done with a lot of people because everybody thinks differently and this is the kind of results that you get. So everybody draws their own line because this is obviously a subjective uh, evaluation. But what you see is when you take uh, groups from different years together, we did that once in the spring and once in the winter, the mean result is surprisingly uh, constant. And in this case, we were really lucky because when we ran our simulations on top of it, we nearly had the same results. So there's one space in the world where this works. Uh, and in order to understand whether there's more than one spaces, we worked at that time with, I think, 15 universities and asked them to do the same uh, thing. And I uh, don't want to go into lots of details, uh, but effectively what we found, this really strong correlation between the predicted percentage of the daylight area and what uh, these uh, students were saying about a variety of spaces. So this uh, paper, I think, ultimately got uh, daylight autonomy into the LEED Green Building rating system. It shouldn't necessarily work. It's in a way surprising that it works so well because um, when you look at a space, the lighting is really more a matter of contrast. When the window is very bright, there's this constant fall of where it becomes so dark that comparatively, if you look at the front wall and the back wall, you feel here it ends. So it's surprising that an absolute simulation such as this one works, but so far so good. And if you want to apply it, it's actually relatively easy to do this type of simulation. So if in your next studio project you would just want to say, this is a daylit space, then you just have to run this annual calculation and then you see where the daylighting ends. And it doesn't mean it's going to be great daylighting, but if you don't have in your model when you set it up right any light, then there's no light in the space. So then probably anything else that you deduct from there on is not really going to work. Right? So that's relatively easy. One could nearly say this is solved in terms of an analysis. The tricky part is really how do we deal with visual comfort and comfort in general in spaces. And typically what we nowadays say is kind of nihilistic, right? We say you are comfortable if you don't complain and you maybe have a view to the outside. So as long as you don't have uh, experience severe glare and we have some connections to the outside, we are already happy. Uh, you can liken that for those of you uh, that have uh, studied or learned about thermal comfort in the 60s and 70s. We also said thermal comfort is the absence of people complaining. Nowadays, we actually try to get more towards people actively expressing a liking for the environment and in lighting, we are just not there yet. So if you follow this, what can you actually do? There's some interesting work uh, from Denmark and Germany where they did comparisons of daylit spaces, uh, did um, uh, high dynamic range photography and had people in spaces and effectively they came up with an algorithm that you can apply which is called daylight glare probability and what you do with that you can effectively take a photograph in a certain way uh, of a space and then run this algorithm on top of it and it's going to tell you the likelihood that somebody's going to experience discomfort glare or not. So the nice thing about this is, and this is how we use it for teaching, that we just ask uh, our students or uh, other designers to take pictures of spaces that they really like and that they don't like, just with a high dynamic range photo photography. And then they get a sense of, uh, of these glare levels. And the nice thing is that within our simulation world, we create the exact same images. So we basically have a way now to go back and forth between reality and simulations. And what is basically not rewarded, you don't want to have too much contrast in the field of view and you don't have too much, too much bright light in the field of view. Now, the tricky thing is, of course, when you talk about visual comfort, is uh, that changes all the time. So again, we are in the situation where we can say you for one moment in time, you'll be fine. But what about all the 4,000 other hours in the year uh, when it's daylight? And what about if we look in different directions? So here, for example, you see a side-lit space. Uh, this is south-facing. And just when somebody looks towards the window, you experience glare. When you look away, you don't. That makes total sense. 
So what would one would practically say, well, don't look to the window, right? Um, and that's, of course, what people do in spaces. They, if you give them the opportunity, think of the sauna space, they adjust themselves to not experience glare. So, so we somewhat have to basically not over... Uh, be too afraid of glare. We just have to provide opportunities to avoid it effectively. So here you see how something like an analysis like this looks. So here we basically tell the occupant you have to look straight the whole year. And then here yeah, this is an annual map and whenever it's orange or yellow, that's in the middle of the day, this is January 1st till the end of December, it's glary. So this is a terrible space unless you let people adjust. But the moment when they adjust, this is not so bad at all. So when it comes to uh, to doing an analysis of the visual comfort conditions, we effectively uh, provide or give people the ability to adjust themselves and move. And then when we look back at our concept, we can basically look at how much light there is, when do they feel comfortable, and how do they control for energy. And um, Here's a little example study for four different facades, how you could apply something like this. And we're using a facade effectively, one with uh, exterior Venetian blinds, which is more of our default setting. One where you can actually adjust the blinds in the upper part and the lower part independently. One with a nanogel, which is effectively a system that has very a very high R values, so very high insulating properties, and lets through diffuse light, and a switchable electrochromic glazing. And with a shade system. And this work is a few years ago uh, old, but you might like it. Uh, a lot of designers are into static shading system because that's a really strong statement, and I see you are into this as well, looking at your school. You have this east-facing shading system. Right? So how do we design an east-facing shading system properly? Uh, if it's a south-facing facade and you want to do a very clean, simple solution, then we know since the uh, since the 1957, when Olga and Olga uh, published their book on static shading systems, how to design just a static overhang. But of course, if you look at a building like here, that's Genie Gang's uh, Aqua Tower, there's this desire for more complexity. So in a way, how do you design something like this that actually works, right? Uh, so in order to do so, this is work by, from our group, uh, John Sargent and Jeff Niemas, that was their uh, thesis at the GSD. They developed a method that we call shader aid. And effectively, how that works is you have a space, and you can put a, whatever you wanted shaped shading system that's standing in front of it. And then what the analysis does, it meshes your shading and then colors it for you. So it's purely visual feedback. And it basically says when it's blue, it's good. When it's red, it's bad meaning that this is actually a liability, which is not surprising when you have this funny head in front of the building and it's so big, then you take away too much light. And where it's white, it doesn't matter. And that's, of course, key. This is the type of thing where we try to provide a feedback that a designer can work with, right? So in this case, if you really wanted to do something, you just cut away the red and maybe consider the funny form here. Uh, so how can you apply something like this in actually a, a, a whole building? So what you see here is the top floor of the Aqua Tower in Chicago. And here this part of the animation just goes through the notion again. So we always want to know for all of these different patterns, these different blocks, is it good to have a balcony there for the floor above or not? And um, basically, as to running through this, we, you need, to, in order to do this analysis, you have to run a, a full thermal simulation for the floor with and without this individual uh, uh, shading system, and then you can decide is it good or bad for the building. And then you can color the whole thing in, and basically wherever, wherever it's blue, you want a balcony, and where it's red, you don't want a balcony. And it becomes interesting because now you can use that for form finding. So in a case, we say the inflection point is the point where the balcony ends, so now I basically have my solar optimized balcony, right? And then I just do that for the whole building. So you basically see this whole thing coming down. And uh, now there comes their trademark move. We do that all the time that we move up the city. So whoop, when Chicago is coming up, you basically see the building reacting, uh, the balcony reacting to the building. And then you can really design back and forth. So you can move your windows up and down, and you see the whole thing reacting to that effectively. So this is really then circular, sustainable 
uh, optimized design. Yeah, and when you go to Buenos Aires, the building obviously becomes fat because you're closer to the equator and you want to avoid shading. And when you go to Anchorage, the, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So this is basically an, an example where you can use uh, computational design and environmental performance and link them together. So if we go back to our little dinky south-facing office, then here you see the type of analysis if you were to do that with a simple shading system in Boston, if uh, we have split lines, we have static shading, a shader rate system, a translucent uh, uh, aer um, aerogel, or you have a switchable glazing. And effectively, really what works best is a split blind. So what does this mean? Really, in the case of our climate here, being able to have a shading system that adjusts in the upper part independently from the lower part is really the best you can do for your system because otherwise our regular blinds go down all the way and by the time you block your glare, you block all the daylight. So having some cleverer system is really worthwhile. The static shading, unfortunately, even though it was so cool in the way it looks, doesn't really do that that much in this climate. Why is that? Because this is a cold climate, right? So um, you don't have that much benefit from a static shading system, even worse. We talked about that in the car actually coming. Uh, Boston is the worst climate for a static shading system because in March and September, the sun is at the same position. But if you've been out in March and September, then the needs are very different, right? You are still cooling in September and you're heating in March. So having anything there that doesn't move creates an, in, an, by per se, it's a conflict that you can't solve. You can optimize it, but the optimization doesn't mean that you're really saving a lot. Whereas when you do that in a hotter or in a colder climate, you get way more clearer uh, solutions there. Right? So this is the framework that we're working on. Just in case you want to try some of these things, we have a plugin that's called uh, Diva for Rhino. Unfortunately, if who's using Rhino here? Yeah. Well, not unfortunately. Awesome. So if you use Rhino, you can just use the plugin. It works for Rhino and for Grasshopper. And this is how we do all our simulations here. Which gets me to the next topic. When you want to do something like this, how actually do you learn to do a proper simulation? And that's not that easy. Um, to teach as well. So the first time I taught this, we used a tool called Ecotech that probably many of you don't even know or remember, uh, which was really uh, phenomenally uh, elegant at the time. And I just gave it McGill um, uh, an assignment, model your crit room, and I thought nobody in the world could possibly get that wrong. Um, and I was, I was wrong. So here you see basically from the two years when I taught this, this is the good solution, and these are all the assignments that were submitted. So completely and utterly all over the place. And that has various reasons. That is uh, software compatibility between the environment you work in. That uh, means that you don't really know how the simulation environment works. But it also means that we have to, when you want to use this, have a basic understanding of the algorithms behind them and what they do. So we get a lot better results nowadays. Uh, we have these two books out. Uh, well, the first one will be out in the spring, and this one has been out for a while. But they basically take you step by step. We have a lot of tutorials, six or seven hours on our website. How do you actually learn to do a simulation? And here you see a comparison from the MIT students when they did the same assignment, and we got way better results. But they only did it after going through all these different steps. So just giving you a sense how do we teach that? This is the exercise in the first week. And this is really trust building. So you have to uh, get an object and model it in Rhino. And you put it in the sun and take a picture twice in the day. And then hopefully you can reproduce your shadow in Rhino right away. And obviously that should work. And if it doesn't work, then you know that you're building probably you don't get it right. Then the orientation is wrong or so. But uh, this is a really strong oops, first step. And it's also helping in terms of trust building. And then we go through a series of other things at the very end. There's a student assignment where you take a picture of a space and you do a, a high dynamic range version of that picture. You then do a simulation and hopefully the two are very similar. So for lighting, we can really get the lighting, the digital world and the visual world, the real world really close together. 
So for energy, that's a lot harder because people can't see energy. You can't walk in a building and if somebody asks you, is that a good building? You can look at certain indications such as when the windows are leaking or it's a single pane glazing, it's probably not awesome. But even if it's a regular put together building, it's very hard to judge. So how do we basically help you get an intuition for energy. And for that, we started a game. The first time we did that was six years ago. And there, uh, that was the original game. So we had this human cluster of experts that were sitting there. And then groups of students had a simulation order form. Did you play that game, Nate? I think you missed it, right? Yeah, it was really fun. So basically, you have this. It's like a, an ordering um, paper that you get. And you have a budget. So you can basically pay for window upgrades, all kinds of things. We could spend at the time you were allowed eight GSD dollars to spend overall uh, on your upgrades. And then you get an energy use. So basically here you see the students with their shopping list and then somebody ran the simulation. And effectively the idea was to say how low can you get energy use. And that was my favorite. I got an email then that evening. I think it worked well. That today the class was definitely not boring. It was kind of a backfiring uh, compliment. So what about all the other classes? But usually I take what I get. Uh, so we are still playing. Nowadays, if you want to do this, we have we call it the Diva simulation game. Now, actually, you um, uh, we let everybody do the simulations themselves. So the way this works is uh, you work in Grasshopper and in Rhino. You can do a massing study. The Grasshopper component calculates the price of the building for you. And again, this time you can spend 50 Diva dollars, effectively, out of 100. And it's about how do you design uh, what is the best combination? So when you play the game, you get a different climate and a different size of a building, and you have to work based on that. And the way it works, every time you run a model, it keeps track of your model. So you can basically run over 90 minutes, maybe 30, 40 variants, and then you can always go back and click on the one that's worked best. And this is, I think, generally how you want to start designing that as you try things, you keep a track of what you've done so that you go back and you actually learn from it. So this, uh, sorry, I keep on having windows popping here on my set. So this works pretty well. Uh, it's easy to learn. Again, it comes with some tutorials. So if you want to try it uh, in teaching or individually, it's a lot of fun. And finally, if you want to join us, once a year we do Diva Day somewhere. The next one is at UC Berkeley. And we have student competition. And the winning student group that uh, successfully applies these tools in their studio project, we usually fly them wherever we are and let uh, the students present. So uh, try it out. The next one is probably in Rome. The next one uh, is so the one in a year as a motivation for all of us to go to Rome. So uh, now I showed you a bit. We have some tools that uh, can be reliably applied and we can apply them in sustainable building design and facade design. So now the next part is really what our lab has mostly been working on for the last three, four years, which is the, the question of, of urban modeling. So what does it mean, urban modeling? Why are we interested in that? Well, obviously, um, um, humanity is moving into cities. More than 50% of the world's population is living in cities. If you look at this in numbers, we effectively have to house net 2 million new city dwellers every week. And if we were to house them all in Boston, then we need around 400,000 new buildings every week. And uh, there are about 100,000 uh, lead buildings in the world. So if we just put these two numbers together uh, to, keep on tr to keep up with all the building activity that's going on, uh, we have to uh, look at more urban level performing. And of course, cities become denser and denser because we don't just want to spread out. We have to densify. So we have to really understand uh, how cities work. And here, just looking at some examples for urban living, um, there are, of course, uh, multiple variants, uh, informal settlements in Rio, very planned, high-density buildings in Shanghai. You have plus zero developments in central um, uh, in Central Europe, Back Bay in Boston, the uh, uh, endless suburbias of Las Vegas, and the single-family home somewhere in the U.S. So if we were only looking at energy use in these buildings, then of course these two buildings were the winners, but of course it doesn't make sense to uh, use this as an example for future uh, 
the living. So our goal has been since then to develop this tool that we call UMI, the Urban Modeling Interface, which basically allows you, it's kind of a diva for the city, it allows you to model whole cities, uh, looking at operational energy use, mobility, comfort, daylight, finance, embodied energy, and urban agriculture. And uh, I wanted to show you a few of these things. Uh, if you have want to use the tool, probably better send me an email because our internal version is a lot more powerful than what we have publicly online. So our first effort uh, in this realm was to combine big data with building performance simulation. And for that, we uh, started with Cambridge. And the background was really Boston had a solar map and Cambridge wanted one. And I said, we can do a better map than Boston. Uh, very important. Uh, that actually works. So um, this is the MIT campus. This is LIDAR data. Now, who is using LIDAR and GIS data here? Some of you, this is, these are data sets that if you're in urban planning are very common. You get them for free from many parts of the world. So as you see here, LiDAR data is basically our point clouds that uh, can automatically from an airplane be generated out of the, which you can create a model of a city. And nowadays, uh, LiDAR data is such high resolution that you see uh, this looks uh, pitiful compared to uh, the uh, level of details that you get nowadays. So we can then basically run for a whole city for every building for every hour of a year solar analysis and tell you really exactly for how each building is going to do for solar photovoltaic. So this is this uh, MapTwell uh, tool where that works in eight cities right now. You can click on an individual address and then you see your rooftop. You can then draw on your rooftop and it gives you with all state incentives exactly how much payback you get for your PV system, how much it's going to cost, how many trees we're saving and so forth. So the idea is really here that we again start changing this time not the minds of uh, architects but of the general population living in a city so that in five minutes they decide how much they pay what, uh, when they get their money back. Back. And just to test how well something like this worked, we went to uh, Wellfleet on Cape Cod that probably uh, some of you know. So it's a small town on the Cape where we did uh, the solar map and we worked with the Solarize coach. And the Solarize coach reached out and 80% uh, of everybody living in that town uh, looked at the map, contacted the installers. In 40% of the time, the installers looked uh, at the map and said, your roof is bad. We are not even coming. So what does makes a roof bad? It faces the wrong way. It's shaded by trees. There are lots of reasons why a roof isn't good. When the installers came, in 94% of the time, they made an offer. And incredibly, 54% of the time, the owner said yes. So that really means that the transact, and so then after four months, 10% of the households bought a solar system in this case, which is about seven times higher than any other solarized program in New England that was run at the time. So the reason is really that we want to get to a level where when you look at your building, everybody gets the same information and it's reliable. Should I get a new furnace? Should I get anything new? Um, we should do our best to predict the performance and then hopefully people are going to do so or not. That's really the goal behind this. This is our urban modeling interface. It's again, it's Rhino based, links Rhino to a database. So you can just draw your city in Rhino. And now we want to do an urban energy model. So how do you do that? We call that UBIN, the urban building energy model. Well, you need various data sets. If you want to model the whole of uh, Bristol, Providence, then you need weather. That's pretty easy to get. You need the geometry, and you need to describe the physical properties of all of your buildings. And that's the tricky part. But when you have that, then you can build a model of a city. So this is the GIS model of Boston. And then for every model, we extended it. We guessed how many floors there are, where the wind windows are, what the type of building is, and then we ended up with an energy model for every building in the city. And that allow us, allowed us then to do this more blanket uh, predictions in Boston for every building, 80,000 buildings, how much energy is being used. And here you see how you can apply this. So here we use, if you know Boston, this is Back Bay, Prudential Center, MIT is on the other side of the river. So we, this is our prediction for electricity use hourly for the hottest day in the year. And this is if 30% of all um, 
Bostonians there would put PV on their rooftop. And what you see is this mismatch. This is called the duck curve, even though I have a hard time seeing the duck. Uh, but what this is, this dark gray, this is the resulting load profile. And the reason why it looks like a duck of sorts is because our electricity use peaks late in the afternoon. Because this is when you are home, have the air conditioning on, you are at work, have the air conditioning on, and this is just where we use most. But the PV peaks in the middle of the day. So if you are a utility, and this really goes back to my earlier comments, you are not just doing your utility a favor by putting PV on your roof. Right? because the utility always has to match supply and demand. And this is incredibly painful, that if in half an hour you have to ramp up and double your output, that's not great if you're a utility. So the, you are not necessarily creating value here for society if we have too much PV and we don't orchestra that in meaningful ways. And this is really uh, these are tools to work with that. right? So an example of what you can actually do is, in this case, we assume that everybody has a Nest thermostat and we are a big brother or big sister. As a utility, you can we, we change the thermostat settings of everybody you want by up to 3 degrees Celsius. And when you do that, you can basically use all buildings as a thermal battery because it really doesn't matter. If you're in a building, if for just for 20 minutes somebody relaxes your thermostat setting, nothing is happening, right? But when you're doing so, you turn off the air conditioning Conditioning piece by piece in different buildings, and you basically you tunnel through that peak. So doing this type of things where you have basically a fully integrated system, you can create enormous value. Right? You reduce the peak by as much as all this photovoltaic at really no extra cost. And uh, Comet in New York actually started a program right now where they give certain uh, clients uh, rebates if they let them control it within reason, obviously, the thermostat. If you're critical, which I hope you are and you're taught to be, uh, you might say, well, how reliable are these models? Could be complete baloney, given that an individual building energy model uh, costs $15,000 for somebody to build. So we want to do that same thing for 80,000 buildings. So in order to understand how good these things actually work, we went into the desert in Kuwait, uh, where our funders were, and we wanted to model these villas here. So these are all very similar single-family residential homes uh, in Kuwait and this is the energy use intensity so the normalized energy use that uh, the range is enormous uh, but it also shows you which is generally true in residential construction occupant behavior really matters right? so you can double triple the energy use of a building and what are the reasons for that well some of the reasons might be you have more kids you have more people living in the building that obviously adds to the energy use or everybody has a TV, everybody sets the thermostat to 63 degree Fahrenheit in winter and uh, in, in the summer. So usage behavior matters. So how do we, we want to basically get this whole variety and understand it. So when we first model this here, you see the total energy use intensity distribution. Here you see when you have one building type, one occupant type, we effectively model a city of robots and then you don't get the spread that you want. We then went into the city and we uh, looked at different types, so which were the buildings that were new, old, and renovated. And then that got us a little closer. And finally, we um, started something that's called the Bayesian calibration, where we throw 800 different stories at each building. So we say, you have, uh, you have 12 kids, you have a family, a uh, dinky family, you have a lot of TVs, you have no TVs. So we throw in this calibration process that at each building, and we only keep the stories that fit the measured energy use for a few buildings. From that, we learn. So you can think about it. We create basically uh, behavior profiles for a neighborhood. And once you have this, then you can model the whole neighborhood very well. We did that. Uh, for the neighborhood that we modeled first, and then for two neighboring neighborhoods, and that works very well. Then we went into Cambridge, because you could say, well, this is in Kuwait, what about here? So then in Cambridge, Massachusetts, we got energy use for 2,500 buildings, and again, we could model it very, very well if we have that. So what does this mean? We cannot, I cannot tell you when I see a building on the street how much energy it uses, because I don't know who's living there. But when I look at hundreds of buildings like this, 
then the distribution, the statistics work in your favor. And I can tell you the mean for 100 buildings, what they use very well. And then, of course, when your utility is, is all that matters. So now we spend all this time and create a calibrated model. What do you do with the model? Um, well, you can use it uh, for energy policy decisions. Again, we went back to Kuwait. We assembled the 20 uh, more influential people in the country that are responsible for energy use from industry and from government. And we said, well, we could reduce the energy use of your whole city slash country by 80%. And uh, then the discussion became really animated and interesting because it then would, would this pay for itself, which in the case of Kuwait it doesn't because it costs them 60 cents a kilowatt hour to produce and they sell it for a cent. Uh, that's in many parts of the Middle East the case. So uh, that's not a winning financial proposition. So in that case it doesn't work. But they really got into tiered pricing system. And in many parts of the world that's now a way to channel basically the transition to paying real energy costs, which means when you pay, when you use a lot of energy as a household, then you probably can afford it to pay more. And when we, this is our tiered pricing system that they proposed in Kuwait, and here we could effectively show that the payback times are pathetic. Uh, longer than the lifetime of some people. Um, and you really need the tier pricing system to make any dent there. And so at least they proposed it. Let's see what's going to happen. Uh, getting closer to home, what else can you do with these models? Here we looked at a neighborhood that some of you might know. That's a Dudley Square Triangle in southern Boston. That's a, uh, that's a neighborhood with a rich uh, history, a lot of uh, local neighborhood groups uh, engagement. And um, we wanted to understand how could a city reduce in this neighborhood carbon emissions on a large scale. So for that, we use census data. And we basically know how many people live in the neighborhoods per block block that's public data uh, that own the buildings and how many are elderly couples, families, young professionals. So we modeled these behaviors and threw that at all the buildings. And we could effectively show these are current energy users. This is by how much energy use could be reduced if we either implement energy saving measures that you can do anytime. So ECM1 is weather stripping. Um, buying a thermostat, um, things, uh, getting new LED systems, things where you just go to Home Depot once and do. And then ECM2 is when you open your pocketbook and you don't do that that often. That's when you get new double glazings, when you uh, do insulation to your buildings and so forth. <laughs> and this is the typical numbers that you would expect. Of course, it becomes really interesting when you see how does a government support this. And right now in Massachusetts, there are 93 um, incentive programs uh, to get homeowners to invest in this. The uptake is pathetic. It's 3 or 4%. Because we know it's always the well-educated homeowners that do it. And here you basically see these are the goals for the city for 2020 and 2080. If only we keep on doing what we're doing right now, we don't get anywhere, right? So we basically have to completely change our energy policy and incentive programs to reach the, the other demographics as well. So this, I think, becomes really interesting as a tool for cities if they really want to engage with that. So a few examples now, what else uh, can we do going beyond operational energy use? Uh, one key component is, of course, at the urban level, also daylight and light to health. So we have a module that we call uh, Urban Daylight that was developed by Timo Dogan from our group, who is now uh, at Cornell. So this allows us to do basically this availability analysis for our whole city uh, very quickly. And uh, last year, New York City's uh, zoning uh, laws uh, turned 100 years old. You might have heard that in your, uh, in your uh, history classes. New York City was really the first city that, uh, that uh, provided zoning laws for step backs because you want access to uh, fresh air and light to people in the city. And if you think of the Rockefeller Center, that's basically built according to the maximum volume buildable at the time. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the laws haven't really changed in New York in 100 years, so we wanted to see if we could do that something better. So here you see basically, this is a typical Manhattan block. 
and we had five different archetypes and then we grew the block bigger and bigger and bigger to FARs over 30, which is enormous, right? And we just wanted to see, can you really hyper-densify without um, uh, killing the daylight throughout the whole city? And so these are these three lines with different density that I'm now going to show you here. So these are the three different types. The top line are actually these very thin towers that you actually see south of Central Park popping up right now everywhere. So commercial base at the bottom, very thin tower coming up. And what you see here, this is, they perform best. Uh, this is the maximum density that you can build in New York. And this is the lead requirement. So with these uh, thin towers, you can basically keep going to an FAR of 28 and you would still not really uh, impediment uh, the daylighting around you. So interestingly, if you convert that into money, you would basically add an extra billion dollar per block in Manhattan if you build something like this. So, uh, I mean, in this case, this is really a win-win situation because we keep people in cities, we densify, and if you build this thing, uh, you can make a lot of profit here as well. But this is basically an, another example where we can just use... Um, this type of analysis to see what makes sense from an environmental performance standpoint. The last uh, project, or second to last, that I wanted to show is really, uh, we call it the daylighting the millennials, more looking at how do people use buildings nowadays. And you guys are probably the same. Uh, if I want to meet, meet people from my group, I have a better chance seeing them at Starbucks than in the lab, uh, because everybody's working um, at various coffee bars. So we try to better understand, especially when the weather is nice. So. Um, you have nice buildings here, the Cook Center, beautiful daylit spaces, but nobody's in the building. So how do we actually predict at an urban level where people are when? And for that, I mean, in a case like this, this is the MIT North Court, uh, our parks and benches are very popular. So we wanted to get a better understanding between these relationships and design and plan cities and uh, areas around buildings to keep people comfortable. So for that, we basically out here and uh, this is the Stata Center, this is the Coke uh, building and in there are two big ca public cafeterias and here are some benches. So people really have the choice to sit inside or outside so it's an ideal spot to just see when do people choose to be where. And uh, what we then did is uh, we used Wi-Fi scanners. So what a Wi-Fi scanner is, uh, it's a device that listens. And your cell phone uh, keeps on screaming all the time, I'm a phone, and my name is, and it gives a number. Your phone does that nonstop. And with a Wi-Fi scanner, you effectively can capture that. Uh, and that's legal. Uh, what is uh, what is also legal, which is more dis even more disconcerting, is uh, you can have a, a device that pretends that it's a router, and then it says, "Hey, phone, I'm a router." And when your phone connects to that, basically the router can see everywhere where you locked in all the systems. So that's great if you are a, a company because you can see where you are uh, where your clients shop. Uh, but that's really something that has to be changed. So the, the point of this project was really, and we had to go through a lot of um, uh, through a lot of uh, committees at MIT to get the permission, really to understand how can we maintain the privacy of individuals, how can we create value as city governments without uh, uh, having too much influence on the privacy of individuals. So that was the idea behind it, with this encrypted ID. So we never got even the number, we got an encrypted MAC ID for everybody. And here are our devices. We work with a company uh, called Sufa, and we collected this. This is what we got between July and May uh, last year to this year. So we connected in this court uh, 30 million Wi-Fi popes. After cleaning them up, we had 14 million. We threw away the weekends because we were interested in work days. So 10 million uh, popes. Then we could throw out, then it becomes interesting because from the profile you can see what are people and what is stuff, stuff such as uh, just outside routers, other devices, sprinkler systems. So we were left with 
uh, 2.1 million signals from over 600,000 visitors, because a lot of people visit MIT every day. And then the rest, these were 16,000 regulars. So you can effectively, based on this, say who comes there and sits on that bench all the time, or is on campus all the time. And now with something like this, uh, you can basically link these decisions to outdoor comfort conditions. Because when you're a visitor, you just go. If it rains, it's not that you're turning around and leaving. You are just visiting there for the day. But if you work there, you make a free choice. So here, then, we uh, did an analysis uh, with a metric called the Universal Thermal Climate Index. Uh, this has been developed over the last 10 years in various uh, mostly European organizations. That's a metric that predicts how comfortable people are feeling outside. And they had done this type of analysis with maybe 100, 150 people. So we could basically redo this now with 16,000 people. So here you see, effectively, there's an example calculation. When you run the simulation, you see when it's green, it's good, and when it's wet, we think you won't like it. It's not comfortable there. And when it gets blue, which in this case it doesn't go, then you don't like it because you're cold, right? And this is what we got for 16,000 people. Basically, this really nice curve, this is how many people are out, and this is how the UCTI conditions are. So this really helps us to say we now have a means to predicting where outside people will be comfortable. And that you can use for all kinds of things. We can, for example, just create little micro areas within a court to make it more comfortable. So we have, the, we have the summer corner, we have the winter corner to basically help us keep people outside for a longer time. We can also use it for more mundane purposes. So here, this shows you, it's, uh, it's hard for you to see. Basically, this tells you the medium time, how long uh, my MIT colleagues and I have lunch outside. So when the weather is really lousy, the mean lunch break is eight minutes. And when it's really great, it rises to 12 to 12 minutes. Uh, fortunately, there are some sane people that have lunch then in the summer up to 20 minutes. Uh, and I'm dying to do the same analysis in another city with another uh, population. But of course, more, uh, more seriously with this, you can uh, effectively also see when people are dwelling where. So if you want to have for retail purposes, we say where, where the best cafes and so forth, you can do that as well. So now how do we put that together? How do we house these guys or do we provide lighting for them? Well, effectively, we are promoting now that you do a full daylighting inside analysis, you do an outside analysis, and then you merge these two ways and find the times when it's best to be in the building, outside the building. So you basically try to august for comfortable living and lighting condition for people. And this is just an example from uh, Nohan Bayomi uh, from our lab that worked on this in Kuwait and tried to create basically neighborhoods that try to mimic that. So you see it's very open urban fabric that tries to uh, create uh, a dialogue between the inside and the outside. Overall, what we want to do is for all neighborhoods, we are creating now the scorecard. So when we do a class in the spring that's called Modeling Urban Energy Flows, where you model all kinds of different aspects of a neighborhood. And then it's like your Pokemon card. Uh, every neighborhood proposal have different strengths and weaknesses, effectively. This was one that I really liked. This was a project that we worked on, actually, for this uh, in downtown Lisbon. And this was a group that was really interested in hydroponics, so urban agriculture. How much food can you grow in cities? And at the time, I thought it's a cute idea, but I thought, uh, I mean, the, the, the famous tomatoes in the double skin facade, that doesn't give you a lot of food, right? But uh, they effectively looked at hydroponic systems on rooftops and PV systems. So what's better for a city? Should I put photovoltaic on rooftops or should I grow food? And uh, even there, uh, we have now models that tell you how much, uh, how much jobs you're creating. And it's really stunning. So here is an example. Uh, this is Gotham Greens in Brooklyn, New York. These systems here, which are hydroponics, have uh, incredible efficiencies. Use 70 times less water than regular system. It's, uh, it's local food that's sold down there. For Lisbon, we effectively showed that with unused land areas in downtown Lisbon, you could uh, cover more than 100% of the food needs uh, of uh, the main vegetable groups for all residents. And we uh, checked for Lisbon, New York, uh, Paris, and Singapore. It's even better in terms of carbon emissions to grow our tomatoes in a basement with an LED than what we currently do. 
And the reason for that is that the food miles traveled, and that includes you for all the tomatoes that you eat over the year. The average tomato travels 3,000 miles to New York uh, because in the winter we keep on eating tomatoes, right? And then they come from Chile and uh, California. So in a way, I'm not sure yet how the finances are panning out, but there are more and more people really interested in that, and rightfully so. It really changes, I think, the perception of how much food we can grow in cities. Of course, if you think back a few hundred years, uh, cities were largely uh, feeding themselves. But with these technologies, we can actually bring that back, right? And uh, as I said, I think you will see a lot of those from a carbon emission standpoint. It even makes sense, brings a lot of jobs into cities. Uh, but it's obviously also really disrupt how uh, our whole food production in the world house is going to work. So this uh, ends really this overview of what we're doing. I hope I could convince you that there are some great tools and that are usable enough that you can use them during design, be it for an individual building or for a whole neighborhood, if you're inclined to work on that. Uh, I think the larger question is really that we, uh, our goal is to use this tool for evidence-based design. So when you make a claim in your studio project or otherwise, that you can somewhat back that up and show, does this really work? Not the famous lines, this is my natural ventilation, building and this is how the air is flowing uh, but really does this work or not uh, with these new urban methods we can really start developing long term strategies and I think the times are over when you can just say I built my green building and I have PV and it's all fine we really have to think of the building as part of a larger uh, urban infrastructure energy infrastructure and th that is happening and you will see that reflected in incentive programs um, to make these tools usable, we try to educate stakeholders, practitioners, and you, and hopefully you're going to pick it up. Uh, when it comes to daylighting, I think it's important also to think about it's not just your building. You also want to basically create comfortable outside conditions right outside of your buildings. And this is actually where the big challenge comes in, because it's very easy for us to know who's going to use and buy the, urban, the building level tools. There's really no... Uh, protagonist right now in cities that does this because municipalities don't have the, the money necessarily to do that but really we're talking here about this meta scale where we don't talk about a hundred buildings we really talk about the urban canyon and how do you make the urban canyon livable and that's very hard to do I think European uh, architecture tends to do this more I think this is something where we have to catch up a little bit here and hopefully we, we see that more and more uh, so where do I see all of this going? Well, I think from our end, we, uh, we will have we have the building level tools, we have the urban level tools. Now the last part is really uh, that we're linking all these tools to our smartphone apps. Right? I think this is, uh, we are doing this, a lot of people doing this, so that effectively the energy system goes all the way to you and tells you to change your thermostat settings, or maybe it tells my watch, my watch tells me that my favorite park bench is currently free and it's comfortable, so you could sit there and I'm sure that's going to happen more and more, that it basically becomes all more integrated. And uh, that's exciting because designers are good at designing GUIs, so hopefully some of you are picking that up as well. And with that, I thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, the tools can be used anywhere. Uh, and uh, we've done analysis of outdoor courts, indoor courts. The tools are completely agnostic. So you can just, if you model it in CAD, uh, the, these ray tracers that lie in the background don't care if you're inside or outside. It's actually going to be easier when you're outside because it's less complex. There are less bounces in the world of outside lighting, whereas inside you have to wait longer. Right? But yeah, that's possible. Thank you.
I'm kind of curious why there was more buy buy in from uh, New York City in terms of the ability to kind of more actively connect with the upper levels in certain spaces with the streetscapes, you know, all these tall buildings. Um. Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think there's a really uh, important discussion going on, and in Boston we have the same thing, what the shadows of these buildings are on parks, right? Uh, so I didn't talk about that. I talked about uh, the daylight in that spaces and the immediate surroundings. Uh, right now you see that when the New York Times, you know, the shadows over Central Park, there's a lot of debate on that. And in New York, uh, in Boston, we have the exact same uh, south of the common argument right now. Well, I think actually the current uh, bylaws are not that effective because they're more looking at uh, when a shadow falls on uh, on a piece of parkland. Uh, I think we can be way more nuanced and with tools such as the UTCI you can actually do that. And I think you have to really look at it under a time perspective. So if you have a slim tower then actually shadows move quicker than we think. And the, the less monolithic a building is, the less uh, disruptive is a shadow. Uh, but that's a very, very contagious issue right now. I, I think it's partly so contagious, and this is why we did this first study here, uh, because the evaluation metrics are not out there. We're really stuck with this old simple shading studies, and it's not that simple. Uh, and I, I think you see a lot more of that going forward. I think we will, uh, uh, some of our next studies will just ask people in various parks how they feel about uh, certain situations so that we can mimic it. But also the UTC, I, I, I was, I'm a big fan of this metric since we showed that it, that it mimics this so well. Because it looks at more, it's not just shadow, it's wind, it's the mean radiant temperature of everything around us, that all influences ultimately how you feel in space. Yeah, Patrick. Do you think that codes that enforce like a screen of a deluxe kind of wall to wall carpet bonding of light in mm -hmm. space should not be also resolved? And if so, how? Because you mean for lighting or for daylighting? For, for, <coughs> where? Maybe do the daylighting yeah. yeah. and artificial light. No, I mean, uh, this is, of course, uh, a very strong ongoing or long ongoing um, debate that so all standards in the world use a light meter and uh, judge, legally speaking, the quality or the uh, legitimacy of a space, how much light falls on a desk. That has nothing to do with how we experience the space. Um, uh, so uh, taking luminance-based metrics, metrics that take view into account would be a lot better. Uh, but it's also a lot harder. We have tried that now for decades to not do it. So uh, I think one should look at both uh, spectra. One should just start, do we have any light within the space and is that enough? Because if I'm under this levels, I, I have some issues. Uh, but then we need to go on. And there are some really interesting work right now. There's visual interest metrics that come out of Switzerland right now. So there are a lot of new uh, the, the visual comfort metrics, new ways to look at the space on top of just do I have enough lights. It will be very hard to get over that, I think. Uh, but again, if you don't have the levels, then it's probably too dark, right? And then, of course, it's good to say, is this an appropriate level? So if it's a church, you obviously don't need 300 lux. Uh, that's wh uh, where you have to maybe start. Yeah, neat. So, I mean, you, so much of what you do is, is discovering uses for evidence-based research. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you see, let's say, your work or in general, the role of rule of thumb in artificial? Oh, I love rule of thumbs. You know that, right? Uh, <laughs> I didn't talk. No, I think rules of thumb are absolutely key. Uh, um, if we did a survey years ago asking, you know, eminent uh, architects how, uh, how they design, and the number one uh, response is always, oh, experience from previous work. Now, it's, of course, too bad if it's your first building because you don't have that experience. So I think these tools are a good way to get you started. And uh, as uh, 
That's my favorite quote from Matthias Schuler from Transola, who is a climate engineer. I don't trust any simulation unless I know the results before I run the simulations. And I go by a similar metric. So if it's not in the right ballpark, there are so many ways to get it wrong. I probably need it. So a solid understanding of what typical numbers are and what you expect is very key. So in the case of light, that means if you really want to become a light expert and you want to have some quantitative um, um, component in your work, then taking this high dynamic range images whenever you are in a space that you like or don't like and get a sense these are good levels. That's super useful. And that becomes a rule of thumb at one point. And of course, uh, we have in that handbook a whole series of rules of thumb that get you going. And the rules of thumb are important because ultimately the computer doesn't design, you design. You have to start up with something and the computer helps you tweak certain things or asks more advanced questions. Right? Yeah, hi. Uh -huh. You mentioned that there was some Well, it's not 50 years, it's, uh, it's in three or four years. No, um, no I think it, in many schools of architecture, obviously, modeling CAT three-dimension is there. And um, these tools become faster and faster. Uh, the graphical user interfaces become better. I think you will see people in real time moving, shaping the building, and you see... I always think about it, the ideal case is like when you do your taxes, and you only look at the top corner. You really want to know, actually, do I make money or not, right? So you need this little dashboard there. And as you design along, basically, you get basically a virtual slap on the finger if you do something where you don't need code anymore. But I, I think that's, uh, that's where we're going to end up. And I think you see that more and more that uh, once you have a, a, you know from the get-go if it's going to work. And these tools just help you to develop this intuition. And uh, I think we're getting closer and closer. I think it's important to have some basic understandings of how these tools work, but we do all of this in the first semester as part of the NIAB class on environmental technologies. So I think you can teach these tools along with the basics. And uh, yeah, I think it's faster than 50 years. <laughs> And these are used in practice, right? Even though it's always interesting for us in practice then, uh, to our diva days, we have a lot of consultants coming or larger architecture firms where kind of the, the sustainability consultants within the large architecture firm do this. Yeah. All right. So we have some snack before we wrap up. Uh, I'll just put it otherwise, thank you so much, Chris. Oh, thank you for coming.